Hey, Church of 1122, this is Pastor Jerry here from Beach. Uh, so glad to be able uh, to be sharing with you. Hope you're doing well. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say way to go for all the great things that God is doing in you and through you and through your ministry. Uh, to Pastor Joby, uh, to the staff of the Church of 1122, uh, to the elders, and to the church family. Uh, it's been an incredible, incredible work of God to see the great things that God has done uh, through this uh, launch that has taken place out of Beach with the uh, beginning of the Church of 1122. Here at Beach, things have been great. Uh, we have seen uh, just God do some tremendous things here within the life of this church as well. Currently, we've got about a 38% increase in our worship attendance from figures last year. Especially since around Christmas, we've been seeing a lot of new faces here at Beach, which says that we're reaching uh, a lot of new people. We've got about 50% of our church involved in life groups, 50% of our worshiping congregation. And uh, that's always exciting to see that people are plugged in, connected with God's word and doing life together. So that's been huge. Anytime you have something like this where a launch takes place and uh, two churches are formed out of one, uh, you see a lot of new leaders emerge. And certainly we have seen that take place here at Beach. It's kind of like the passage you're going to be looking at this weekend from Acts 15 uh, and 16, where uh, you see new leaders emerge when a need arises. And so with Paul and Barnabas uh, moving in two different directions, you find people like Silas and Timothy uh, stepping up uh, and taking on new roles. So that's been exciting to see a lot of new leaders uh, step into roles both here and at the Church of 1122. The best years are still out in front of us. I'm excited for what God is going to do in Joby's life uh, through and through my ministry and through all of your staff and our staff, uh, your elders, our leaders. Uh, these two church families uh, are certainly advancing the kingdom of God in a powerful way here in Jacksonville and around the world. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. And uh, let's make our mark in this generation for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Take care and uh, God bless you and all that you're doing. Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15. We're not going to talk a lot about being a dad so you can relax and just get ready for your free lunch, all right? Which is always weird when your kids take you to lunch, isn't it? That's like, thanks, uh, I think I'm paying the bill. All right, here we go. <coughs> That's the gospel. Acts chapter 15, we are in week three of, uh, of, of this series called Restore, and on week one, we talked about this idea that we should not make it difficult for those who are coming to the Lord, that the church got together to vote on what it means to be saved and about all these Gentiles that were coming to Christ, and do they have to be like one of us before they can believe like one of us? And so uh, the answer was no, and James, the brother of Jesus, says, why would we make it difficult those who are turning to the Lord? And so we as a church decided to be on, on the same page as, as James there, and we want to be an on-road to salvation and not a roadblock to salvation. It's why we do church the way we do. And we rolled out the Restore Project. If you weren't here this fir that first week, um, uh, then we let everybody know what we're going to be doing over the next six months, this Restore Project. In the seat back in front of you, you can pull this little piece of literature out. And in the bottom right corner, there is an opportunity for you to commit financially to get on board with what we're doing here at the Church of 1122. And what we are doing is uh, building out the back 25,000 square feet of unfinished Walmart space to make more room and worship attendance, to add a few offices, but primarily it's to add more new gen space uh, for our families and for our little guys. We still are turning families away almost every week because we run out of space here for our little guys, our elementary and preschoolers, even though we've taken over the karate dojo for fourth and fifth graders, and even though uh, we've put a modular unit in the back behind, behind where we uh, park and things, um, even with all that, God continues to move, and we don't want to make it difficult, those who are coming to the Lord. And so in a little while uh, later in the service, I'll give you kind of an update of where we are on that. Uh, but if you get bored during the sermon, you could just read through this, and it'll let you know what we're doing, and there's pictures and blueprints. And that's what we did on the first week. And then... 
And then last week, we just said, can't we just honor some other people? Can't we honor one another? That um, <clears throat> the church is called to be unified. Jesus' primary prayer in John 17, the only prayer that we can answer that he prayed is that we would be unified as disciples of Christ. And we'll never be unified as churches until we honor one another. And you wrote literally thousands and thousands and thousands of letters to some of the church pastors that we partner with, not just in Jacksonville, but all around the world. And we will be delivering those out. And you have no idea the kind of encouragement that God will use your words in the life of a pastor in his church um, all around the world. And so then we pick up in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. I can't believe somebody would preach three weeks on one chapter in Acts, but I know a guy that does. And so here we go. Acts uh, 15, 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. And so <clears throat> Barnabas and Paul... Paul says, all right, listen, we don't want to just be about uh, drawing large crowds in all these churches that we planted all over the place, but we want to go and encourage them and, uh, and strengthen them. It's about making disciples, not just converts, which, by the way, if you've been attending the Church of 1122 and you would like to move from just attending as a once-a-week event and, and become a part of the family, that a part of the way that you get plugged in is at the end of any service, you just go back to the Connect Center, and you can either serve on one of our serve staff teams, or uh, you could be in a disciple group. And so we would like for you to not just be an attender, uh, but to, to be part of the family. And so we'd love for you to get connected there. It's kind of what Paul's telling Barnabas. He's like, all right, Barney, get your saddle. We're going to have to saddle up and go visit some of the churches that we've planted so we, we can encourage them. Verse 37. Now Barnabas, he wanted to, make, uh, wanted to take with them John called Mark. Now you'll all remember Mark. Mark was the guy in Acts 13, 13, that when Paul and Barnabas and John Mark were taking the gospel to this place called Pamphylia, John Mark said, you know what, this is a lot harder than I thought. All right, planting the church is kind of hard because they try to kill you in Pamphylia. And he's like, so I'm out, all right? God bless your ministry, but my ministry's taking me back home to play Xbox. So he went back home. And just, he just kind of left halfway through the mission trip. And so uh, Barnabas wants to take Mark to, uh, on this second missionary journey. Uh, but here's something you need to know about Barnabas. Barnabas is a tender guy. Barnabas is a, a loving guy. Barnabas' name means the son of encouragement, okay? And so that's just the kind of guy Barnabas is, all right? He, he's a forgiver. He's encouraging. He was always that guy to pat you on the back and give you a little pep talk. Uh, Barnabas would have been a great t-ball coach, you know. Uh, by the way, how many of you are Barnabases in the room? Like, you're encouraging. You're very forgiving. You're gracious. See, you're all afraid to raise your hand. It's okay. Come on. Raise your hand. All right, we got some people. Good, good, good. Okay, good. I, I'll, I'll, maybe you figure this out about me. I'm not so much uh, like Barnabas. But here's my guy, verse 38. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And so Paul's thinking, I ain't taking that cat with me. He had his chance, right? I mean, I, I'm not going to take a guy on another mission trip that couldn't make it through the first mission trip, all right? Does he not know what I did in Lystra? They threw rocks at me till I was dead, and then they brought me back to life, and where did I go? I went back into Lystra to preach the gospel. Why? Because I'm not wimpy like John Mark, all right? And so that's the kind of guy Paul is. So you have these very distinct leadership styles. You've got Barnabas, can't we all get along, and let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya, and I love you because God loves me, and he's, and Barnabas is awesome, and we need Barnabases in this world to offset the Pauls, and Paul is, he's a driver, he's a type A, he's an entrepreneur, he used to be a Pharisee, and he used to be a terrorist, and there's still a little bit of that in there. And so these are the kind of leaders that you have leading the first church, and they're on the same team. Verse 39, and there arose a sharp disagreement, a sharp disagreement. Can you imagine how that sharp disagreement went on? <clears throat> Barnabas says, hey, listen, I've been talking to John Mark, and he said he was sorry, and I believe him. You should have seen the look on his face. You know, he, got a little, he, was, he was really sorry about what he did. And so, Paul, I really think we need to take him on our next missionary journey. And Paul's like, we ain't taking that wimpy little cat on our journey. No way. And I know we get second chances and third chances, but he can take his second and third chance somewhere else. And I know we'll sing songs to Jesus in heaven together, but until then, we ain't doing ministry together. 
all right, because that joker tapped out when I needed him most, and I'm not taking him again. He's a liability and not an asset, and I don't hire ministries. I do ministries, all right? Sound like you ever heard that talk before? And so uh, that, that's kind of where Paul is, and then you can see Barnabas going, yeah, but come on, man. We got to let him go. He deserves another chance. I think it'll be good for him and his soul and his character, and there was a sharp disagreement, Sharp disagreement. By the way, this is part of this. It's, it's verses like this that make me even believe the Bible more. Why? Because if Luke was just making up a story to start this thing called Christianity, then wouldn't you leave that part out of the text? Two of the main church fathers in the first century, you would have just rewritten this part and said, oh, this was a strategic plan on the five year vision of the original church. But that's not what happened at all. There was a sharp disagreement. In other words, that's the way the Bible says they're probably screaming and yelling and fussing and fighting at one another. And so this morning, we're going to talk about a little bit how to fight and how to fight well and what's that all about. Some of you didn't know as Christians that we were going to fight because here's the thing about you. Did you know you're either coming out of conflict, going into conflict, or in the middle of a conflict? And if you go, not me, well, then you're just too dumb to talk to, but hang it. We'll sing a song in 45 minutes, all right? Just, we'll be back. <laughs> But conflict is just a part of our lives. And so I don't have time to fully go into this because we're going to tell a little bit of the story of the launch of 1122 for the majority of our time this morning. But I just wanted to uh, give you a little reference. I, I, did a, I did a series on Galatians a couple years ago. And if you go to coe22.com and click in the sermon archives, you can go to the, I think it was the second week of the Galatians series. And, and I go verse by verse through Galatians chapter 1 on how to win a fight. And I don't know, I love to fight, and I love to win when I fight. And so if you're going to be a Christian and you're going to fight as a Christian, I'd love for you to go and listen to that sermon. But I do want to highlight seven things out of, it's really out of Galatians, but it works here too, about how to fight. The first one, when you fight as a Christian, and again, Christians are going to fight. Because you're Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to be in conflict and not going to be in disagreement. It just means we do it differently. The first thing the first way you fight as a Christian is that you've got to be in fellowship with someone. You've got to be in fellowship with someone. So Paul and Barnabas, they have some history together. They've got some relational bank together. And because they had this fellowship with one another, this relationship with one another, they could point out the blind spots in one another's lives. That's why I'm so opposed to Twitter and blogs and Facebook posts about people that you don't even know and have never even met. Okay? They're first and foremost in fellowship or relationship with one another. <clears throat> the second thing is this, is you better speak up. If you are going to fight, you better speak up. That There are times, Christians, that we have to engage and not avoid conflict. How many of you by nature just tend to avoid conflicts? Raise your hand, right? All right, now let's try it again. Now, those of you that really avoid conflict, this time go with me. You avoid conflict? All right, good. You notice how they even raised their hand just for a second. They're like, I did. Okay, sorry. <laughs> he looked at me. Right, all right. There are going to be times in your life where you have to cowboy up and you have to engage in the conflict. The friendship or the whatever you need to fight about is worth the fight. It's worth the engagement. And so what happens here is that Barnabas and Paul, Paul never had a problem speaking up, but Barnabas, he has the guts to speak up and to engage. And so he's going to say, hey, Paul, I think you're wrong here, all right? I really think we've got to give John Mark another chance. The third thing is this, is when you're in conflict, you need to do this face-to-face, -face, that they're not talking about each other to other people and calling it prayer requests. They are face-to-face. -face. Now, I don't have a Bible verse on this. This is just a little experience. If you ever need to have a conversation with someone that is serious or sensitive, it should not be via text or email or Facebook. It needs to be faith. Here are all the old guys. Amen. All right. A bunch of young whippersnappers. You're right. But they're right. They are right. You go face to face. You can't read tone in email. You can't read tone in a text. How many of you have gotten in trouble because you sent a text and that, I didn't mean it that way. All right. And so they go face to face. Uh, another thing, this is my favorite one. If you are going to fight with somebody, especially your brother or sister in Christ, you better be right. And what I mean by that is, uh, you better know the gospel. You better know the difference between your own preference and God's precepts. And you should identify that going in. 
that, hey, listen, what I'm about to argue with you about is really just my preference, but I think it has some merit. Versus, uh, here's what the Scripture says. You better know the difference. And, and you better know the gospel. You better know the gospel. It's why I want the church of 1122 so saturated with the gospel that even when you're in a conflict or an argument with somebody else, that, that it would be gospel-centered, that you would be fighting from the cross, that you would, be, you would see everything in this world through the lens of the gospel. That's why we pound the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sin over and over and over. There's a, a friend of mine <clears throat> at, uh, at Beach who is a retired Secret Service agent, and one of the things the Secret Service do, primarily, you know, they protect the president and his folks, but one of the other things they do is they um, apprehend and prosecute counterfeit people, you know, people who make counterfeit money. It's one of the things they do. And, and he said that he would tell me the way you get ready to identify counterfeit money is not by studying the counterfeits. You don't have enough time in your life to figure out all the different variations of the counterfeit dollars that people are making. So what the people that identify the counterfeit money do is they just become so familiar with the real thing with the real dollar they just study the real dollar so much that when something different than the real dollar shows up even if they can't identify exactly what's different they know that's not a real dollar and so that's what we need to do in the gospel that you are so saturated in the gospel that when somebody comes at you with something that not that's not the gospel you go no 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 no, no. that is that is not the gospel so when you fight you better be right you better be on the side of the gospel and i'm just going to tell you I love to be right, uh, <clears throat> which leads me to this next one. You better check your own motives. If you're going to fight and you say you're fighting for the sake of the gospel, you better check your own motives. Is, is this about you being right or is this about his righteousness? This is the one I have to check more than anything else because I love to fight. I love to fight. I love to fight verbally. I love to fight physically, all right? I mean, I, I sign up, train MMA with my friend Larry Sheely so that I can fight. And I like to fight against people that I can beat up, okay? That's what I like. I just like it. And then I love to verbally fight too. And I always have to check myself to see if I am fighting just, just for me because I like to be right. And, I'm, and, I, and here's the thing. I'm right so often that I think that I'm always right. One time Gretchen said to me, you think you're always right? And I go, of course I think I'm always right. Do you think I would be arguing this way if I thought I was wrong? And if I knew I was wrong, then I would switch to the side that was right, and that would make me right. Right? <laughs> right. But the Bible says, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, not me being right. And all these things will be added unto you. So if you're going to be in conflict with somebody, is this about his kingdom and his righteousness or is it about you have to be right? Another thing, if you're going to fight with your brothers and sisters, is you better be a first-hand witness. They are talking about things that they have seen and heard. Paul had an opinion. He had a point of view on this. That, listen, I've taken John Mark on missions with me before, and he can't cut it, and he ain't going back. And Barnabas is talking first-hand experience. I know, but I've spent time with him since we got home, and I think he can make it this time. Look, uh, gossip is gossip. Whether you do it in a circle called a disciple group and say amen at the, not, at the end of the night or not, it doesn't matter. They, we talk to people and not about them. And so they are talking about firsthand witness. This isn't, I saw on Facebook and I was trolling around their Twitter and they said and he said and she said, uh-uh. It's firsthand knowledge. And then the thing, that, the thing that makes us different than anyone else is this as Christians, is that when we fight, and we will fight, that we should always seek reconciliation. That we should always seek reconciliation. That my relationship with you is a reflection of my relationship with the Lord. And I have been reconciled unto an almighty, sovereign, perfect, and just God, even though I was a wretched, black-hearted sinner. And because of what Christ did on the cross on my behalf, I have been reconciled unto him, even though I didn't deserve it. And so that means in my relationship with you, there is nothing that you could do against me that I could look at you and say, well, I can't be reconciled with you because God has forgiven me and reconciled me unto himself. And this is a step, reconciliation is a step beyond forgiveness. Forgiveness is you don't owe me anything anymore. Reconciliation is that we are going to re-enter this relationship. 
And so the goal is always reconciliation. And so even though there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other, you've always got to let the Bible be commentary unto itself. So if you go to 1 Corinthians, if you go to Galatians, if you go to Colossians, all three books written after the book of Acts, so after this event, then what you find is Paul, who's the author of 1 Corinthians and Galatians and Colossians, you'll find verses in there about Barnabas, and he calls him his friend, his brother, and his co-laborer. So that they differed on, uh, on the vision of the way they saw church and what church should be and how they should go about it. They differed, and they had a sharp disagreement. Sharp disagreement. To the point that that they said, hey, we're not going to do church together anymore. All right, you're going to go do it that way, and I'm going to go do it this way. And yet they were reconciled. They were unified under the gospel, but that doesn't necessarily mean uniformity. That the way they, the way they did church, see what their problem was, they had a staffing issue. That's what it was. It was an HR problem. It's always HR that gets you in, problem, in trouble. And so they had this sharp disagreement. And even though they decide uh, to go in separate directions, yet they are unified under the gospel. But, but unity does not mean uniformity. And so <clears throat> Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed. And having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Here's the point. That unfiltered debate and unswerving support of the gospel are essential to the unstoppable movement of the church. Let me say that again unfiltered debate. In other words, these guys have a sharp disagreement, and that's okay, right? They were brave enough to, to say what they thought and, and to say what they meant and to cowboy up and have that sharp disagreement. And, and again, it was the kind of disagreement that if you were in the room with them, you would be thinking, oh, you'd be so uncomfortable. You ever been in that, like when a husband and wife are having a sharp disagreement, and you're thinking, I really shouldn't be here now, right? You're trying to get out of the situation. I'll bet if we were there during that meeting where they had that sharp disagreement, and, and the Apostle Paul is like, hey, look, you can take you and your kumbaya singing John Mark, and y'all can sail away if you want to, but we got stuff to do. I bet it was sharp. And so they, they have sharp disagreement, yet they have unswerving commitment to the gospel. You see, every single church should have the same mission, that is to make disciples. And the reason is because I didn't make that mission up, Jesus did, all right, in, in the great co-mission where he says, go therefore into all the nations and make disciples. And so every single church, every single um, gospel-centered, Jesus-loving, Bible-believing church ought to have the same mission, and that's to make disciples. But the vision of the way they do that can be all over the place, and praise God. Different kind of music, different kind of people, different kind of discipleship strategies and staffing strategies and size churches, and all of that's fine. That there's unity in the mission under the cross, but, there's, but that doesn't mean uniformity. And so you can have unfiltered debate and unswerving support of the gospel, and it's essential to the unstoppable movement of the church. The unstoppable movement. Because here's the thing, there's not a person in this room... And there's not a church or a denomination, and I mean little local sea church, that can stop the unstoppable movement, this ecclesia of the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Because Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so this movement is unstoppable, but it needs us to have two things, unfiltered debate and unswerving support. Of the gospel. So there are three things. There's probably a hundred, but I could think of three. There's at least three things that resulted from Paul and Barnabas separating. Number one, it's in your notes. Sharp disagreement led to a clarity of vision for each of their ministries. Sharp disagreement led to a clarity of vision for each of their ministries. Sharp disagreement. The Bible says it's iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody sharpen a sword, but it requires two things, heat and friction. And look, you get any two strong leaders in the room, and often you get heat and you get friction. And if you look at it, it's not a very pretty thing to watch, a, watch somebody sharpen something, right? There's sparks flying, and there's heat, and there's friction. And you, you may even look at it, and you think, I think you're going to damage the sword, but if you know what you're doing, then it's actually a sharpening. And what happens here, because it is in the context of brotherly Christian love, that even this sharp disagreement leads to clarity of vision. 
Barnabas has a clearer picture now of God's call and command on his life going forward. And Paul has a clearer picture of God's call and command in his life because of the sharp disagreement between these two men. Secondly, that new leadership rose up due to the vacuum created. That there was new leadership that rose up because instead of Paul and Barnabas being one team, now they're two teams. You see, what begins to happen here is that uh, is that, that Barnabas obviously takes Mark and they go in one direction and Paul, Paul goes and grabs, he's got to get a new, a new like, you know, junior VP here. And so he looks around and he gets a guy named Silas. Silas turns out to be a pretty big deal. In the next chapter, in chapter 16, guess who rises up? A young pastor named Timothy. Now, if you're new to Bible study, let me just clue you in. Timothy's a real big deal in the Bible. He's got two books in the New Testament named after him. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but this is just kind of one of the rules. If you get a book in the Bible named after you, you are a big deal. I mean, when we're walking around in heaven together and you bump into a guy and go, oh, what's your name, Lars? Oh, hey, I've never heard of you. Cool. Well, what's your name, Timothy? You mean like the Timothy, first and second Timothy? Yep, that's me. You're going to be like, oh, you're a big deal. That's how that works. And if... <clears throat> If they'd have gone with Paul's plan, there is no Timothy because there's no room for him. But what God uses in the separation of these two men is that other leaders are able to rise up. And then thirdly, both ministries were blessed. Both ministries were blessed. Under Paul's plan, they would have just gone to Syria and Cilicia. But under this plan, not only do they cover those places, but they also cover Cyprus. And both ministries are blessed. This guy, Timothy, he grows up to be the pastor of the church of Ephesus. That's a big, big, big deal. And then how about Barnabas' ministry? Anybody ever heard of this guy named Mark? He wrote a little piece of literature maybe you've heard of. It's called the Gospel of Mark. He wasn't very creative with his titles, but man, he could write. And they were, <clears throat> both ministries were blessed. That only a sovereign God could take sharp disagreement between two brothers. And they decide, all right, we, we need to part our ways. We're rallied around the gospel. We agree together on the gospel. But the way we're going to do this are separate and different. And so they go in two separate directions. And God, God blesses their ministry. God raises up new leaders. And he uses that sharp disagreement to sharpen their vision for how they would, how would, they would serve God. So what I'm going to do is spend the next 30 minutes or so. And I want to tell you about the church of 1122 and how we got launched, how we got started. And as you know, um, <clears throat> we just go verse by verse through the book of Acts. And when I got to this section in Acts 15, I just saw so many parallels between our story and between this story. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about, about how we started. And it's why we showed that video with Pastor Jerry Sweat updating us on what was happening at Beach, etc., and, and, and if you don't know who Pastor Jerry Sweat is, by the end of the sermon, you'll know a lot about him. And if you're a guest or you're brand new, you may, this may bore you to death, but we think it's important because there's a lot of you that are part of the Church of 11, 20, thousands of you that are part of our church now, and you weren't a part of us when we first launched. And we thought um, it'd be important for you to know kind of how we got here. And I also find it very, very appropriate to, to share our story on Father's Day, um, one of the things that I'm finding as I'm beginning to connect with lots of African-American pastors in town, uh, you know, we're, we're really moving in that direction and trying to partner with a lot of African-American churches and, and uh, do things together with them. And, and, and I'm getting to meet some guys, Bishop, uh, Bishop George Davis and Bishop Vaughn McLaughlin and, uh, and, and all kind of, everybody's a bishop too, right? They come in, hey, I'm bishop. I go, I'm the Cardinal of 1122. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, <laughs> while we're giving titles, I'll take one. So... <clears throat> But one of, the, one of the coolest and neatest things really from that African-American ch church culture that I'm finding is that they will in, these pastors will introduce me to these, these older guys and they say, this is my father. And they don't, they don't mean like literal biological father. But in that, in that tradition, the men in their lives that either led them to the Lord or grew them up in ministry, they refer to as their father, like their spiritual father. And so my spiritual father would be Coach Bull Lee, the guy that led me to Christ, talk about him all the time. But I have another spiritual father, the guy that the mo one of the most influential people in my ministry, and that's Pastor Jerry Sweat, that about 10 years ago, um, God in his sovereignty decided to put me under the spiritual authority of Pastor Jerry Sweat. 
I think I told you a couple weeks ago, or last week maybe, <clears throat> that I was this close to stepping out of ministry and thought we'd give it one more chance. And so we came, and, uh, and Gretchen and I came to apply and, and interview for me to be the youth pastor at Beach United Methodist Church. And, it, and, if, and if I'm honest, really, the only reason we applied at Beach, um, quite honestly, I was ordained Southern Baptist. The reason I pick on Southern Baptists all the time is because I am one. I'm a recovering Baptist, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> And, and the only reason, I'd never even been to a Methodist church, okay, quite honestly. So I wasn't Methodist, didn't even plan on liking it. And uh, I said, well, Gretchen, let's go, let's go interview in Jacksonville because it's, I mean, it's at the beach. <laughs> They'll put us in a nice hotel. They'll probably pay for our meals. It'll, it'll be like one of those timeshare things. You know, you give them a couple hours in an interview and you get to hang out for the weekend. So that's what we did. <clears throat> and so we came in not even expecting to like it and... Uh, I told you I'm not a very good pastor, right? That's just what we did. And we're sitting in this room in the interview in this circle of just really amazing people that turned out to be some of my very best friends. And, and since I was employed at a church, and, and that was, it, you know, there's a reason I was leaving, but I didn't have to have a job immediately. I had the opportunity to interview the churches that we were interviewing with. And we interviewed all over the country. And um, I, I just ask everybody in the room, tell me why you go to this church. I bet you, you passed nine churches to get here today, so why this one? And person by person, they just went around the room, and they talked about the grace that they had experienced at Beach UMC. People were crying. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And so we're walking out of that interview. We hadn't talked about any of the practical things yet. And Gretchen leans over to me and says, we're coming to this church, aren't we? And I said, yeah, I think we are. And... Um, and so at that point, we began to pray a prayer. It's not even an original prayer. I ripped it off of Rick Warren from his book, Purpose Driven Church. But I thought if it worked for Rick, maybe it worked for me. And I began to pray, dear God, we'll go anywhere in the world you want us to go, but could that be the last place? We're surrendered to go anywhere you call us to go. But once we get there, could we just really plant our roots and raise a family and have the grandkids come visit us in this, in this place? And so we came to Beach United Methodist Church, and I was the youth pastor and um, <clears throat> things took off. I mean, I got into town. I had the, the group, the, the greatest group of adult volunteers in, like, the history of youth ministry. I mean, it, they were just the best. And Beach was about to tear down an old fellowship hall. And I, I said, hey, can I just get the money that you were going to use to tear it down? And we could build a, our own youth building. And so we built that and finished that out. And the numbers of students exploded. And the numbers of adults that were helping us explode. And everything was just going, I mean, it was just going so great. And every week, Pastor Jerry would show up to our youth ministry, and he would sit in the back with a notebook, and, and I'd talk, and he's writing stuff down. And I remember going, what in the, I, I just went up to him one day, and go, hey, w w what are you doing here? Imagine your boss just showing up to your desk once a week at your biggest presentation, going, go ahead, Scooter, all right, <laughs> every week. And then just to find out, he was just, he said, I love to hear you teach, and I just, you know, I don't really get to go to church since I'm always preaching, so I just wanted to come to church. And so, it was pretty awesome, and, he, and he's so encouraging, and he would laugh the loudest. Man, if you want to feel like a comedian, tell a joke to Pastor Jerry Sweat, and he will <laughs> belly laugh. <laughs> and it's great. It makes you feel awesome. And so, he would be there, and then, um, um, I, so I was, I was his children's youth pastor, and uh, his son, Ryan, interned for me, and his daughter, Ashley, was one of our worship leaders, and his, his youngest daughter, Lindsay, was another one of our worship leaders, and we hired, I hired his wife, Denise, to run all of our uh, worship and production stuff, and so God knit together the Martins and the Sweats in just a very, very close relationship. We were with them all the time, and things were going as good as it gets, and then our church had an idea, really, a bunch of us together decided, hey, we need to start a little something new. We've got a lot of students, and that's great, and then there's kind of a gap, and then we've got a lot of their parents, and that's great, and so let's start a new service, and the team just decided that I would be the speaker of the thing, and uh, we had a 930 contemporary service at Beach, and, and, I, and I wanted to start the, the new service as close to after that as I could, and quite honestly, we just thought 1122, we could remember it, and that's what time it started, so that's what we called the thing, all right? And then we had to go back through the whole Bible and hope we could find one verse in the thing <laughs> that made some sense, right? Because like Leviticus 11.22 is about sacrificing a ram on the third moon or something weird. And so <laughs> it's a terrible way to create a church name. But that's what we did. And, and we didn't know we were creating a church. We had no idea. And so we called it 11.22 and it started. And, and the first few months, it went okay. Uh, actually, not so great. Um, and the way we first started is I was just going to be one of the teachers. All of us were going to take turns, 
and I would do about half of the teaching, and then everybody else on staff would do the other half. And so, um, and that's when I began to say all kind of ridiculous things, like, uh, you got three years to go on a mission trip, or this is not your service. That's what I started saying. And the reason I started saying it is because 1122 didn't even have to work. I thought, if this doesn't work, I'll just keep being the youth pastor, because it's great. I love it anyway. And, and, uh, and I, I did things like, we were kind of worried about money. The service wasn't taken in enough to pay for itself. And so um, I said, I, I've got an idea. We're going to quit passing the plate. I don't, I don't know if you know, but the first few weeks, we used to pass the plate, and I hated it. Because in Corinthians, it says, don't give under compulsion. And when that little plate was, I felt like we were trying to compel you to give. And so I was like, cut the plates out, put them away. Build me some boxes. Brad Bowen, build a box. We're going to make it hard to give. All right, we're going to hide them around the room. And at the end of the service, you've got to find one and give that way. That's how we're going to give. And, and Ben Williams came to me and said, man, what are you doing? Are you trying to kill this thing? And I said, yeah, I'm trying as hard as I can to kill it, all right? Because it doesn't have to work. We all had church jobs. We could just go back to our previous lives, and it would have been fine. And the, part of the reason I was trying to kill it is, is because I thought if this thing is going to be based on how good I can preach and how good Ben can sing, then let's kill it as quick as we can so we can get on to whatever that thing is that God has for us. And then I couldn't get over Gamaliel's advice in Acts chapter 5. Gamaliel was talking to the Pharisees that, was trying to, that were trying to squish Christianity. And he said, if this thing is of these men, it'll die out anyway. But if it's of God, then you can't stop it if you tried. And so that's why the first week of Compassion, remember we did Compassion Sunday? And I said, everybody in here is sponsoring a Compassion Kid. And we gave everybody a packet, and we lined the back of the church with trash cans and said, but if you don't have $38 a month, because I know you don't have 38 then you just drop your kid in the trash can on the way out the door <laughs> because that's where he's going to eat tonight anyway. See you next week. People are crying. Like, I ain't never coming back here. Fine. <laughs> right? And then they'd bring four people with them. You ain't going to believe this. And they'd come back. <clears throat> so it was crazy. And so... In January, we made some organizational changes, and I said, okay, I got it. I got to make a decision here. And, and I just said, um, you either got to give me the whole thing. I can't just be one player on the team. I got to run it the way I run it, because, again, my, my leadership style and Pastor Jerry's leadership style are very, very different. Um, in, in fact, uh, Pastor Jerry is very much like Barnabas. He's the most encouraging man I've ever met in my entire life. If you want to feel good about you, hang out with Pastor Jerry a little bit. He will find the good in you and exploit it and then build it and develop it. I mean, he's just that way. And I'm a lot like Paul, all right? You know, very straightforward, and this is how it is. And uh, you dropped it off on my mission trip, leave. All right, that's just kind of how I am. And so, so I said, I've got to run 1122 and put a team together and run it the way I run it. And we stacked hands on that and said, let's do it. And so from January, it started It started gaining a little traction. And by our very first Easter, 1,500 people showed up to 1122's first Easter. I was literally standing on stage with Pastor Ben, and there had been a few hundred people there at that point, and he looked at me and said, what are all these people doing here? <laughs> I was like, I don't know, but you better sing good, all right? And so <clears throat> and that's what began to happen. And then one service turned into two, turned into three, and it was going like gangbusters. And then uh, a group of us, some leadership of, of Beach, of which I was on the leadership team at that point, I had um, turned over student ministry to Pastor Ryan Stone. And uh, now I was on the leadership team doing big church stuff with Beach. I very reluctantly became the executive pastor. I told Pastor Jerry when he invited me to do that, I said, now, you know, I'll, I'm going to ruin the place because I'm going to ask questions. Everything we do, I, I'm going to say, hey, listen, I know your tradition says this, but the Bible says that. I'm going to go with the Bible, and I'm going to shake it up. and going to make you miserable. And he said, come on, let's do this. And so we did it together, and lots of people met Jesus, and the services started growing. And so we took our leadership team off campus for a few days to just talk about the future of Beach United Methodist Church. And the, the leadership team decided, <clears throat> the leadership team decided, um, well, we had this fundamental decision to make. Are we going to be the best version of a Methodist church we can be, or are we going to organize around our best understanding of the way the New Testament says to organize a church to continue to just do what God has called us to do? And that's a fundamental question. Do we need permission from the denomination or are we just going to kind of go in this direction? But one of the things we didn't want to do is we didn't want to snub our nose at the United Methodists. We weren't trying to do anything sneaky or anything like that. We really passed a big thing that was on Pastor Jerry's heart was to be an upward influence in a dying and declining denomination. For the last 40 years, the United Methodist Church has been on a decline. 
And that's true of every mainline denomination, just a, a, a major decline. And so what was on his heart, it, it wasn't the biggest deal in my world. I mean, I, I, I was neither really for or against the denomination at all. But it was very important to him, since it was important to him, it became important to me, that, that we would um, be a model of what it looks like to organize a large United Methodist church and then show that as a model. Maybe other growing United Methodist churches could adopt that model and it could be helpful. And so that's kind of what we set out to deal, do. And we were on that for about two years. And the fundamental question was, are we going to get permission, be the best version of a United Methodist Church, or are we going to kind of keep going in the direction that we're going in? Everything was heading towards organizing Beach like 1122. My, my title was going to change. Lots of things were going to change. And then Pastor Jerry went on a sabbatical, about four weeks of prayer and study and rest and all of those things. And he came home. And on the, we, we had a staff meeting where we told our staff, all right, here's what's coming next. We're about to roll out to our church these changes for Beach, and Beach is going to begin to take a new direction. It's the same direction we've been on for the last bunch of years. And then uh, Pastor Jerry gathers a smaller group of staff together and says, hey, I don't know if we can do this or not. We're going to do what? Yeah, I, I need to go to my district superintendent and the bishop and the United Methodist denomination, and I need to get their approval. And so... Now remember, you got Paul and Barnabas, all right? And so um, let me just say there was sharp disagreement, <laughs> sharp. Uh, for me, I mean, it's me, it's me. And, and, and then just for a second, <clears throat> imagine, imagine this from Pastor Jerry's point of view. Put, your, put yourself in his shoes for a second. So you hired this youth pastor, and the thing starts blowing up. And, and, you know, you've got this great relationship with him, but he's, God, what a pain in the butt. He's always asking questions, and the Bible says, and why don't we, and you bunch of wimps, come on, work harder, go faster, Arr! you know, all the time. But every time he preaches, all these people get saved, and so what do you do? Well, what does Pastor Jerry do? He moves out of the way and says, why don't you take the pulpit of the fastest growing service at our church? And every other pastor I know, as soon as that would have happened, they would have swooped in and went, well, uh, 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 I'll take it now. But not him. You know what he did? He just kept getting out of the way and just being the biggest cheerleader. And then when we got to that moment, he said, I don't think we can do this. And so he went to get permission from the United Methodists, and they said, no, yeah, you're right. You can't do that. All right? I'm, I'm not an ordained Methodist, so I couldn't be a pastor in the Methodist church. Uh, um, there was, you know, my understanding of the New Testament, the Bible says things like there's elders and deacons and pastors, and I thought we should have those at our church, and the way the, the Methodists have organized, it's really based on the U.S. government. Um, Charles and John Wesley in the 1700s, 1800s, when they were organizing the church, the pastor moved around all over the place, and so all the decisions were made in committees, and that's the way they organized it, a lot like kind of the checks and balances of government, and so you can imagine how well I think of our government as far as that goes. I know that's a dumb way to follow. We doesn't work. In the Bible, they voted in the New Testament. We're going to find it in Acts. They voted one time on where to go on the boat. They ended up in a shipwreck. In the Old Testament, they voted once, and they built an altar, uh, a golden calf, and God killed them all. So I don't think voting that way works out so well. It's point leadership. And so we would have all those kind of discussions. And so there was unfiltered dialogue. There was sharp, sharp disagreement about the future and what we were going and, and, and where we were going. But we had a, an unswerving commitment to the gospel. That my mission and Pastor Jerry's mission was the same. And that was to introduce people to Jesus, have them surrender their life to Jesus, and then watch them grow up in him. And so we took that same leadership team to this off-campus thing in St. Augustine, Florida, and we all went around the circle and talked about, okay, where do we go from here? What do we do? You know? What do we do? And everybody in the circle gave, here's how we can all stay together and get back on the plan that we developed a couple years ago. And it's just a little pause, but we can overcome this and we can figure this out. Me included. I, I'll, I'm staying here and this is what we're going to do. And then ultimately I said, Pastor Jerry, here, here's the deal. This is your church. God has put you as the under-shepherd of Beach United Methodist Church. And by God's sovereign grace, he has placed me under your spiritual authority. So this is your decision and your decision alone. You've got all the wise counsel we can give, and so you're going to have to make this decision. And in typical Pastor Jerry fashion, he said, well, I've got to pray about it. And so he, said, he spent that entire night in St. Augustine with no sleep, but he prayed. And I went and drank a beer and went to sleep. That's what I did, all right? <laughs> and then he came, we cat together the next morning and sat there, 
and my future is hanging in the balance. At that point, I believed that God was calling me to do this. I didn't know it would be like this, but to, to lead a church like this. And Pastor Jerry looks at the group, tells us a little bit about his night in prayer, and then he says, <clears throat> he says, I believe it is time that, that Joby, you pastor your own church. Now, in that moment, I thought, well, here we go. All right, let's do this. I got it. Now, I thought I'd be delivering pizzas and trying to raise money, and I didn't know. I didn't know anything about Walmart and about a law, any of that sort of stuff. But I thought, here we go. And I looked down in the Bible, and it was open to Acts 18. We'll be there in a few months. And, and I, I looked down, and these were the words, and they're in red in my Bible. And I, the first thing I saw in my Bible, and I know this is out of context, but I just looked down and saw these words, do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. It's the first thing I read. Now, now, now let, me tell, what, let me tell you what happened from that second on. So Pastor Jerry, looking across the table, and he says, I think it's time that you pastor your own church. And you know what he could have done? He could have done. And so good luck with that. And just got up and said, all right, everybody that works at Beach, come on. If you want to ride on the church van back to your job, then get on the church van and let's go. That's what he could have done. Pastor, we'll pray for you and your ministry. Right? By the way, Paul, that's, that might be what Paul would have done. Let me tell you what Pastor Jerry did. From that second, I mean from that second, until September 23rd this last year when we opened the doors, he leveraged everything he had, all of his United Methodist collateral. He leveraged it all for the launch of the church of 1122. You have no idea how many meetings he went to and how, many, and how much flack he took. He had United Methodist pastors going, how in the world could you let that happen? You were the fastest growing United Methodist Church in our whole state. Now you're going to let everybody leave. I can't believe it. I mean, just getting attacked from his own team. And that joker stood in the gap for me. And you didn't even know this. And he stood in the gap for you. And he leveraged everything. He took so many hits from some of his friends and coworkers. And he put his pension and his career and his future and his retirement in the denomination that he gave his life to. And he rallied around the district superintendent and the bishop of Florida. And they came together. And you know what they did? For the sake of the gospel, they rallied together. And he stood in the gap to launch the church of 1122. Amen. And there. <clears throat> so there was a, a, an article written in a magazine. And, you know, if they got magazines about cats, they got magazines for everything, right? And so there's magazines about church planning and stuff. And so this guy, Tim Stevens, the guy I know now, he wrote this article in a magazine about what was happening here. And, and I'm not going to read the first part of it because it's about me and it's kind of weird. But then I'll pick up where it says. It says, last month, Mark Beeson, that's the, the guy's lead pastor. He says, last month, Mark Beeson and I had the opportunity to go to Jacksonville and to spend the day with Joby and several of the leaders from Beach United Methodist Church. And the story that is unfolding there is unlike any I've ever heard. Let me give you a few highlights. Beach UMC is a church of around 2,000 people attending. Approximately 1,500 of them attend what is called 1122. This service started less than three years ago and has exploded in growth. The other 500 people at Beach attend either the original contemporary or traditional service. This article came out last summer. 1122, led by Joby Martin, has quickly outgrown the church that gave it a place to birth and experiment. Most senior pastors would be intimidated by this. Not true of Jerry Sweat. He is embracing the growth. In fact, he initiated the decision to expand the reach of Beach UMC and rather than split, launch it into two brand new churches. Beach UMC will cease to exist at hit, as it has been known. One of the churches, the new beach, will be United Methodist and continue to be led by Jerry Sweat. The other church, called 1122, will be led by Joby Martin and will be non-denominational. I want to make sure you read that last bullet. A United Methodist church is birthing a brand new church which will not be United Methodist. And it, will be, and it will be blessed with the full blessing of the district superintendent and the bishop. If you aren't United Methodist, you have to trust me when I say this is miraculous. 
And then he gets a little sarcastic, which I kind of love. It's almost as if the leaders in North Florida have decided that it is more important to further the kingdom of God and grow his church than it is to grow the denomination. Amen. <laughs> and so I can't help but see the parallels between the two. All right, like we just said, three things happened there between Paul and Barnabas. There was sharp disagreement, but it led to a clarity of vision. New leadership rose up, and both ministries were blessed. So, yes, there was sharp disagreement. I mean, I remember sitting at that table in St. Augustine, and Pastor Jerry says, I think it's time that you lead your own church. And then he said, and I have a real peace about this. And I thought, that's funny because I feel a bit nauseated. So it's (laughs) funny how the Holy Spirit works different in our lives. But it has helped sharpen us. And it's also, praise God, it's renewed a vigor and vision in Pastor Jerry to lead to lead Beach Church. And we heard that he said they've grown, in, they've grown 38% in attendance and they have 50% of their people in small groups. And I know that uh, weekend attendance is just one little measure. It is not the driving force whatsoever, but this represents people. When we were together under one roof uh, a year ago, then the average attendance on a weekend would be about 2,000 people. Two weekends ago, the average attendance, when you combine us and, and, and Beach United Methodist Church, the average attendance is, is well over 5,000 people. You see how God is blessing both ministries? God is blessing both ministries. Um, and not only that, that new leadership has risen up. I, I couldn't be a lead pastor in a Methodist church. But not only that, there are new leadership uh, positions available at Beach that people have stepped right into. The same thing that has happened here. Pastor Ryan Stone is like my right-hand man. Do you guys realize that at Beach, five or six years ago, I hired him to run our middle school department? That's what we brought him on to do. In fact, we hired him so young that the first middle school mission trip that he took, he wasn't old enough to drive the rental van, all right? <laughs> so, so we had, hey, can we get an adult that can drive the van? Hertz won't let Pastor drive the van. He can take your kids out of the state, but you can't drive the Hertz van. And so... So, vision has been clarified, new leadership has risen up, and both, please hear this, both ministries have been blessed. So listen, Church of 1122, the posture that we will always take is we will honor my spiritual father, Pastor Jerry, and we will honor Beach United Methodist Church and partner with them for the sake of the gospel until Jesus comes home. Amen? Amen. And so before we launch this church... About two or three times, just to make sure, I went to Pastor Jerry and said, Pastor Jerry, you're my pastor. God put me under your spiritual authority. And I will not, like before I signed the lease on this place, I said, I won't sign the lease without your blessing. I won't cut the ribbon on opening day without your blessing. There was a few things I just went to. I didn't even have the language yet. Some of my African-American pastor friends are teaching me this. But in other words, what I was doing is going to him and saying, "Um, I'm not going to do this without the blessing of my spiritual father. And so he gave us that blessing. And now, what does that mean for us as we go forward as a church? Well, there's so many things that we learned from Beach that we've got to keep doing. One of them is this restore project. It's this restore project. We cannot be the limiting factor on what God wants to do. I mean, God is bringing so many people to come to know him in this place. We cannot be the limiting factor on what God is doing. When 1122, the service first started, then, then we didn't have the money to invest into that. But what if we'd have had a scarcity mentality at Beach and not ever started the, the service 1122? And when we went from 1122 and added 722, people were like, what are we doing? We, just, we can't do that. It's too aggressive. And where would we be? We wouldn't even be a church if we hadn't have done those things. So if you're not involved in the Restore Project, I need you to get in the game. Right now, we have about 150 families, which is pretty good in two weeks. We've had about 150 families commit or donate to the Restore Project. I need that number to go to 1,000. I want 1,000 families at our church to be involved in the Restore Project. Now, two weekends ago, we had over 4,000 people here. So if 25% of our attendance two weeks ago gets involved in this, and 1,000 people could give $2,500 over the next six months, all right, for all you that grew up in public school, that'd be $2.5 million. That would, be, that would exceed what we needed. And when we get to 2.4, we're going to shut it down. And why? 
Because look, a part of our heritage from Beach is that you invest in what God is doing and then you get out of the way and just, and just praise Him that you even get to be a part of what He's doing. Another thing that we're going to do, because we learned it from Beach, is on August the 4th, we start a new service. 522 on Sunday afternoons will begin. Amen? Good. And we are, we got you on camera clapping, so now you have to go. No. <laughs> August the 4th, 522 Sunday afternoon service to make room for more. We'll need hundreds of people from the 9 a.m. and the 1122 service to go to 522. All right, you'll get up, go to the beach. You know, it's, it's 1122 church, so you don't even have to shower off. You can come, Sandy, and uh, it's going to be full bore for our children's ministry, for our kids' experience. All right, we, we purposely did it earlier so that you could get home on time and get those babies to bed, and I understand, all right? And so 522, you can start praying about it now, and a few weeks before that, then, then I'll get commitments from us, those of us who will go to the 522 service to make uh, room here. Another thing that we're going to continue to do because we learned it from Beach and what they poured into us is we will, over the next few years, really, we will launch new Church of 1122 sites in and around the city. Because some of you crazy people drive for, I mean, literally an hour to come to church. I mean, there are people from Kingsland, Georgia, and Gainesville, and we're going to try to get as many people out of Gainesville as we can, all right? We're doing our best. <laughs> <laughs> but our reach is really, really... Well, and I know some of you people are crazy and will drive all that way, but your friends aren't going to drive all the way here with you, and I understand. They have a life. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the church and come your way. And so we can begin to pray right now about where God would have us plant Church of 1122 campuses in and around the city of Jacksonville. And not only that, we're going to plant gospel-centered churches. You don't know this yet, but there are some of you sitting in this room right now, and God is calling you to be a pastor in the church of 1122 or to be a lead pastor of your very own church. And so this, this, this fall, we're making a way to identify those people and raise them up and train them so that we can send them out. And so I've got good news for you. God loves you, and I have a plan for your life, all right? Some of you don't even know it yet, but you are a pastor. <laughs> and the reason I can tell you that is because I never in a million years thought I'd be the lead pastor of a church. But my pastor, Pastor Jerry, identified it in me and raised me up and then sent me out. And so he taught me how to do this. And so I'm going to do this in several of you. And God's going to raise up leaders. Some of the leaders will pastor campuses at our churches. And some of the leaders will, will get raised up and, and we'll launch you as a senior pastor of your very own church. And why would we do that? Why would we continue to build out in the Restored Project? And why would we start new services? And why would we start new campuses? And why would we plant new churches? Because if Beach hadn't have done that for us, then we wouldn't be here at all. It's a part of our DNA. It's who we are, and it's what we do. Every week in your notes, I have put this, this verse from 1 Samuel 14.6. And I've hope, I hope that you've read it, and maybe you've read over it, and you thought, oh, what is that even talking about? What is that about? There's this, it's in the Old Testament, and there was, this, there was this king who had gone bad. His name was Saul. It's a different guy. Not New Testament Saul that became Paul. It's Old Testament Saul. He'd, he'd gone bad. And he had a son named Jonathan, and, and they're camped out next to the Philistines. The Philistines are, are kind of like the, the Klingons in Star Trek. All right? They're always around, and they're, they're kind of proverbial Old Testament bad guys. All right? And so Jonathan, one day, he rises up and says, we're going to do something about this. There's about 600 Philistines camped sort of near them. And so Jonathan by himself gets his armor bearer, the guy that toted his sword and his shield around. He's like, all right, armor bearer, let's go. We are going to go do something about these Philistines. And then this is where he picks it up. In, in 1 Samuel 14, 6, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. That's the Philistines. And look what he says. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Perhaps, perhaps, like maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure, but perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf and nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or few. And here's his plan. He says, here's what we're going to do, armor bearer. We're going to stand in front of the 600 Philistine soldiers and we're going to show, we're not going to even sneak up on them. We're going to show them. Here we are. And if they say to us, you stay right there, we'll come down to you, then we're kind of screwed. But, but. If they say, come up here to us, then we will know that will be a sign that the Lord has given them over into our hands. That sounds like a terrible plan, doesn't it? <laughs> and you know what the armor bearer does? 
He picks up his armor and he goes with Jonathan. Why? Because perhaps, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. You know why that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible? Because that's how I lead. That's how I lead. The armor bearer never even considers, but what if he doesn't? Have we walked through that game plan yet? Do you have a vision? I mean, did, it, did an angel come and speak it to you? Because if an angel showed up and said, go and attack, then we can just go in there and kill everybody. They can't do anything about it because God told us to. If a burning bush told you to do it, just walk in in confidence because God has already given you the victory. But you're talking about we're going in on perhaps. Jonathan goes, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. We're going to do our part. We're going to do everything we can do. And perhaps God will, I know he's on our side, but perhaps this time he will act on our behalf. And when, we, when I signed the lease on this building, you know what? Perhaps somebody might show up. When we preach the gospel, perhaps somebody might hear it. Everything we've done has been on just walking in faith. And so the reason we're going to build out Restore and the reason we're going to plant campuses and the reason we're going to plant churches and the reason we're going to raise up new leadership and new pastors, the reason 1122 the service got started, you think we knew this was going to happen? Ha! No idea. But perhaps... Perhaps, perhaps, God would work on our behalf. And, and so why we do what we do is because we do the possible and we count on God for the impossible. Amen. And the reason we showed up here today and talk about the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus and talk about the gospel week after week after week is just perhaps you'd bring your dad with you. And your dad doesn't even like church, but the only reason he's here today is because it's Father's Day and it's what you asked for him to do. And he came with you and perhaps the Holy Spirit would move into his heart today. And perhaps God would do what only God could do. And perhaps God would save. And next week, we're trying to create this kind of place so that you could bring your friend and your coworker and your neighbor to walk into an environment. And they don't even like church and not even sure if they believe in God. But they could show up next week and just perhaps, perhaps God would move and do things that only God can do. And perhaps God would work on our behalf and save your friends and your coworkers and your family. And perhaps God would continue to do in our church what he has been doing, not for us, but to his name be the glory. Amen? Amen. All right, would you please stand and pray with me? Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you so much that you have done such a mighty work in this place. And to you and you alone be the glory. And God, I thank you for Pastor Jerry Sweat for Beach United Methodist Church. God, I thank you for Rising Tide Methodist Church that planted over a bakery about 80 years ago. And I thank you for folks like Lee Buck and Anita Osborne that in that bakery in between donuts would pray for a move of the Holy Spirit in Jacksonville. And God, I don't think they had any idea, nor did I have any idea, that a part of you answering that prayer would be in an old Walmart 80 years later. And God, we are humbled to be a part of what you are doing. Humbled. God, we thank you and we praise you for clarity of vision. Lord, for new opportunities of leadership. God, we thank you for the blessing, the favor you've got on this ministry and on Beach's ministry. But God, more than anything else, Lord, we look to you and we look forward because perhaps, Lord, you would continue to do what you have been doing. So, Lord, we know that it is not based on our faith, but on your faithfulness. And so, God, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, every week we respond. God initiates, we respond. We respond by coming to the altar. If you've got some junk you need to lay down, lay it down at the altar. We respond by bringing our tithes and offerings to the giving boxes around. You can respond today if you want to be a part of the Restore Project by bringing your commitment card and dropping it in one of these buckets or one of the one of the uh, offering boxes around. And one of the biggest ways we respond is we join our voices together in unity and we sing to the one that loves us so much. So let us respond.